Uh, now, um, I asked just before the, uh, uh, the break, uh, who is uh, Otaba uh, Kuguano? Uh, who is a William uh, Cafe? Uh, you may not know, unless you are definitely a student of uh, black British uh, history, but uh, someone who uh, is here to tell us is uh, someone who's uh, written uh, books uh, about uh, those uh, two characters and, uh, uh, and much more besides, uh, Martin Hoyles. Uh, welcome to the show, Martin. Mm -hmm. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, <laughs> now, is it uh, your mission to uh, dig out the black historical characters that are not so much talked about because you know we know or you know got, got growing awareness in Black History Month and schools about you know the likes of uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know uh, Equiano and so on but um, we don't hear much about the characters that you you write books about. Well there are certain characters that still are not very well known that's why I mean if you take Kagona uh, I don't think anybody's heard of him really. Well just reference who that is that's um, can you it's um can you explain to us who Kago? There's the book. Caguano. Yeah. Caguano. Yes. Yeah. Was one of the uh, campaigners against the slave trade in the 18th century, and he was uh, originally a slave himself. He was kidnapped from Africa, uh, in present-day Ghana. Take uh, as he was old, uh, only 13 years old then, and taken to the West Indies, and was a slave there for several years before he was brought to England. And uh, here he somehow became free and became a servant to a couple of artists. And that's when he got involved in the campaign against the slave trade. Mm. And he eventually wrote a book which uh, argued against it. Mm. But what was interesting about him, unlike uh, Equiano, he was against slavery itself as well, not just the slave trade. And mm. so he was ahead of his time there, you know, ahead of even people like Wilberforce. Wilberforce is the only person people know really about... <laughs> Uh, the campaign against the slave trade, but he wasn't against slavery. He thought it was okay for the time being because they weren't civilized enough to be free. Mm. So it's, it's partly in the book I'm trying to debunk Wilberforce yeah. as well as put forward other people who are more important. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Before we talk about, uh, you know, uh, William Cofe, uh, what's really sparked your, um, your interest? I mean, have you always, you know, been interested in, uh, in, in uh, Black British history or the, uh, the slave trade? I think the first time I got interested was reading Peter Fryer's book, Staying Power, The History of Black People in Britain. Mm. And that opened my eyes to all the people that hadn't been heard of before. Mm. And how certainly old, how old were you then, roughly? Uh, I should think in my 20s. Okay, then. yes. Yeah, so it was some time ago. And then since I got married uh, to my wife, Asha, I got even more interested in black history. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started off doing a book called Remember Me, which was achievements of mixed race people, past and present. And we wrote that for our daughter, Rosa, in particular. But that revealed a whole he heap of people that had not been uh, talked about before, going right back to Robert Wedderburn. 200 years ago mm -hmm. and so that was the, the way we got into it and since then we've done quite a lot of research on um, black history with my wife particularly to do with dyslexia and uh, performance poetry and uh, it's gone on from there really can't stop <laughs> so how did you come across the character Kuguano um, and how did you go about researching and um, pu pulling the book together because like you said um, one of the things that you mentioned early on in the book is that we do know about William Wilberforce and he's kind of um, attributed with as the kind of person that ended the slave trade and we don't often hear much about other characters or about the um, abolitionist movement or the uprisings that continually happened during slavery that contributed to the end of the actual practice. Um, but w where did you go about finding the, the information? Um, well, I, I go to the British Library regularly and do a lot of research there. Yeah. And what was interesting was that the campaign against the slave trade was a massive campaign in this country. Hundreds of thousands of people were involved in it. And all we hear about is Wilberforce, mm. which is nonsense. I mean, women were involved. They had a sugar boycott to try and stop people, you know, okay. drinking tea with sugar from the West Indies in it. And Wilberforce actually opposed that. He said women aren't, aren't meant to be involved in politics. Mm. So it's a question of redressing the balance of history, really. Mm -hmm. and of course, uh, famously, uh, William Wilberforce wouldn't let black people into his house as well. Exactly. That, that's, that's certainly what, uh, you know, what I've heard and read, anyway. Uh, no, I've got the evidence in the you, book. You have evidence in the yes, book? Okay, yes, cool, yes, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give the book a little bit of a plug um, yeah. uh, shortly. Yeah. Uh, of course, so we've got um, a, a march against uh, or in favour of reparations, which is happening uh, this Saturday. It's uh, it's happening at 11 uh, a.m. at uh, Windrush Square in Brixton, and they're marching to Parliament. Of course, last year there were around 7,000 people that took place uh, in the march. Uh, that was the, the organisers' estimates. I think the police said about three or four thousand. But uh, there's always a difference between police, <laughs> police estimates police, and yeah. uh, the actual number of uh, feet on on the streets, uh, so to speak. But uh, uh, you know, looking at uh, the, the issue of, of enslavement uh, br brings um, all, us all, almost inexorably to, to the issue of uh, what uh, happens as a result of it. Uh, of course, we had the uh, documentary, uh, just a two-part documentary by uh, David mm -hmm. Olasaga, yeah. which we've been discussing extensively uh, on this uh, show. Uh, but uh, you know, do you think that uh, knowing more about uh, you know, the, the likes of Otaba uh, Coguano will actually um, uh, sort of, you know, feed into... Um, you know, as a sort of logical conclusion, talking about um, not just uh, enslavement but reparations as well? Yes, I, I do think so. And I think definitely it should be on the agenda. I was asked this recently at uh, another talk I gave, and somebody wanted to look into their own ancestry and see who was involved in it and so on. And in the program you mentioned, there's a lot of evidence of who received the money, the £20 million that was paid out in 1834, was it, mm. 1835, mm. went to all the slave owners. And mm. they were all around this country, exactly. all over the place. Widows, churches, ministers, everybody. And people in the Caribbean as well got, um, um, you know, compensated. <clears throat> but that, that's not here on the, on the table today, but another one that I read that you wrote was about um, somebody called Ira Aldridge, who was an actor a um, kind of Shakespearean actor, a kind of all-round actor. And from the book, I really got the impression that he was kind of, you know, Samuel L. Jackson, Denzel, like, <clears throat> like a, a brilliant... All rolled into one. Yeah, I got the impression that he was... He was the most celebrated actor in the whole of Europe in the 19th century, Ira Aldridge. Mm. And so many people still haven't heard of him. I mean, he came from New York when he was age 17 and got a part playing Othello almost straight away in an East London theatre. And he, he toured the whole of Europe. He went to Russia, mm -hmm. to Germany, Poland and so on. In fact, he was buried in the end in Poland where he died on tour. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that I read in that book was that after a lot of his performances, he often would kind of give a speech, an anti-slavery yeah. speech. So he was a very strong activist and advocate and he was well respected and well renowned for it. Exactly, and he sent money back to the States as well to help Yeah, slaves. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And of course, uh, another book as well, which I'll just uh, hold up here, giving a big a book <laughs> plug, if we can get the Thank camera on it. Um, no, we haven't got the camera on it. Um, is, uh, is William uh, Cuffey, who's a Chartist uh, leader. Uh, now, uh, there we go. Can we get that? Um, now, um, the Chartists, of course, w um, w were contributed to the, the Magna Carta, I, b I believe. And uh, maybe I've got this wrong. So I'm sure yes, you're correctly as a starting as a celebrating the 800th anniversary of, uh, of, of the Magna Carta. Mm. I'm sure you'll correct me on that point. But uh, William <laughs> yeah. Cuffey was a, a very prominent um, Chartist. So tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, about him. The Chartist movement, again, is neglected. Mm. I mean, because it's a working-class movement yeah. that was the biggest political movement ever seen in this country and was campaigning for rights to vote, basically, and for uh, MPs to be paid so they didn't have to be rich people. All those kind of things were going on in the 19th century. There was a lot of trade, un trade unionism, activism as well, wasn't there? Yes, to, to yeah, trade well, unions. Well, better conditions. The trade unions were, were formed, surely? No, no, they were formed. I mean, Cuffe was a member of the Tailors Union, and they, he was on strike in 1834, a strike which failed, and after that he couldn't get any work because of that. And that's when he joined the Chartists, campaigning for more civil rights. Okay. But what's interesting about him is uh, his grandfather was an enslaved African, his father was a slave in St. Kitts, and uh, mm -hmm. he eventually got freed and came and settled in Chatham, okay. where William Cuffey was born. Definitely. Uh, time mm. is uh, unfortunately uh, against <laughs> us. Uh, it is. It's uh, flown by oh uh, like, uh, uh, like nobody's business. Uh, it's like an arrow, literally, time has flown by. Uh, just a quick plug, um, Martin Hoyles. You can find uh, all your books and, on Hansib, published by Hansib, so uh, just uh, uh, go and look that up, and uh, definitely... Uh, worth the read. Um, now, um, Alex, uh, this is your last show. You're uh, about oh, to uh, yeah. uh, leave me. 
and uh, form your, your own uh, show, which is um, broadcasting tomorrow. So yes. uh, just uh, uh, one more, just very briefly, uh, to uh, tell us about it. Yeah, um, it's a show, I, I don't, don't think I want to reveal the name of the show just quite yet. I'm kind okay. of doing it a bit under the radar. It's a secret at the moment. It's a secret, yeah, but it is about um, law enforcement, about the police, about um, community relations, and we will be having guests on and, you know, um, probably developing and evolving the format um, um, as we see how it goes, but we're, there's going to be definitely a, a large element of having the police in to talk to us, to talk to us all, and hopefully this will um, engender some some positive dialogue, but also get under the skin of some of the issues that have um, that, okay. that are there. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been, been an absolute pleasure. It's been a great working you, with you uh, as well, on, on the show. Uh, I will be back. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as always, uh, next Thursday at uh, one o'clock. So uh, tune in then for, for much more uh, discussion, uh, guests and much, much more. So uh, have a fantastic day and I will see you next week.